Welcome to this uh, lecture. Uh, this lecture is on physical vapor deposition. If you remember in the last lecture we were talking about silicon dioxide and in silicon dioxide we are talking about a different way to grow silicon dioxide. One is your CVD which is chemical vapor deposition and second is your PVD which is physical vapor deposition right. In physical vapor deposition that means you have a material which is in physical state and you have to melt it or you have to take the, uh, you know bombard the ions so that the atoms would be dislodged from the material material and there, there is a deposition of this uh, uh, film on the substrate. So, mechanical way or electrical way of uh, you know depositing the film which is physical in form from the physical form to the thin layer is called physical vapor deposition. This is just a very easy way of uh, teaching you, but uh, uh, within the physical vapor deposition there are different techniques. One is called thermal evaporation, second is called electronic beam evaporation or e, e beam evaporation and the, the last one is called sputtering. Right. So, let us see each one in detail. Uh, uh, this lecture we call as a thin film uh, deposition techniques and physical vapor deposition. So, physical vapor deposition now uh, uh, is more versatile than CVD. How you know how it is more versatile than CVD? Once we look at the CVD which is the chemical vapor deposition, then we will see that um, how we call PVD as more versatile than CVD. And uh, PVD uh, allows uh, us to deposit most of the materials uh, that are used in fabrication. So, that is the advantage of PVD. Um, if you have silicon wafer and on silicon wafer you have your oxide that means it becomes oxidized silicon wafer. Just for representation I am not drawing the oxide on both the sides if you want you can draw it also. So, silicon dioxide on silicon wafer you start with silicon wafer and then you have silicon dioxide right like this. Can you deposit silicon dioxide with PVD? Yes. Now, you have a wafer once again which is oxidized silicon wafer. And you want to deposit let us say metal. Can you deposit a metal? Let us say you have aluminum. Can you deposit this metal with PVD? Yes on this metal I want to deposit zinc oxide. Can I deposit zinc oxide with PVD? Yes. You see the versatility that you can deposit insulator, you can deposit metal, you can deposit semiconductor, you can deposit semiconducting oxides on the uh, uh, on the silicon wafer with help of the PVD and thus PVD helps us to uh, or is the technique by which we can deposit almost all the materials that are used in the fabrication. So, let me just rub it around. Okay. So, now in uh, the PVD the surface reaction occurs very rapidly and so very little rearrangements of atoms occur on the film surface. Now, first you should know how this thing works right. So, let me do one thing I will just uh, get one more slide. What we are talking about in this case is that in PVD the surface reaction occurs rapidly ok. Wh what is surface reaction? What is rapidly and what are what do you mean by very little arrangements or rearrangements of the atoms right. First let us understand how the PVD works. Hmm. So, you have a holder that holds the material and in the holder you put the or you load the material, hmm? you load the material. Then you have a plate to hold the substrate, a plate to hold the substrate. So, this is called substrate holder. Right? Substrate, what is a substrate? Silicon or oxidized silicon wafer right. What is this? 
this would be your source. So, we can say source holder just to make it easier we call this particular holder boat ok, we call it as a boat. This was easy you have oxidized silicon wafer, you have a substrate holder, you have a source holder or a boat right. Instead of boat we can also have a coil in which you can load the wires like this. These wires are your let us say we, we want to have aluminum as a source material. So, we, these wires are also aluminum all right. The substrate holder and silicon wafer or oxidized silicon wafer remains as it is ok. Now, <coughs> you apply a voltage. So, I will just remove you remember right the bottom is called the this one is called so source is called boat right boat and what material we have aluminum. So, we apply a voltage right very high volt to this particular boat or to this coil ok. What will happen? Depending on the resistance of this material, depending on the resistance of the coil right, the current will flow through. When current passes through there is I square R heating, I square R is called joule sitting right, joule sitting. Now, because of the joule sitting, because of the I square R heating, the material loaded onto the boat will get will melt right, this will get melt and finally, after melting it will start evaporating, it will start evaporating. in this direction right. Same thing goes here also. Let me draw the substrate a uh, little bit bigger right. What is this? This is your oxidized silicon wafer and as I said the material will start melting and evaporating in this direction. Correct, but <coughs> if there is air. So, now let us use the logic if I have if I, I air is what insulator or it is a conductor air is an insulator. So, if I uh, hold a, a power cable uh, where there is lot of power right uh, that passes or at the end of the cable can the shock let us whole example let us so that is good that you can you, you can see me now. Suppose you oh, this is oil insulator ok I am, I am wearing a proper gloves I am holding it through some equipment and end of this there is very high voltage extremely high voltage. If I show it to you like this and you are standing let us say 2 feet away from me I am just showing you like this would you get a shock most likely not right. Why? Because there is a air in between and air is an insulator. So, possibly when we when we are heating this material if there is a air then there is lot of collision with the with the uh, particles in the air right. That collision will call distraction and because of that the material that is melted may not reach uniformly to the substrate. So, what is an alternative? Alternative is that we make sure that the material can can travel as much as possible without colliding with any other particles. That means, the material that we want to deposit when is melted when is evaporated can travel at the max distance before 
or it collides with anything. If it does not collide then we can get a better uniform material uh, layer or thin film on the substrate. So, to do that what is a solution? You have a vacuum. So, that entire thing is kept in a vacuum chamber. This entire thing is kept in a vacuum chamber. Okay. So, then there is a term that we will learn called mean free path. Mean free path. Okay. So, the mean free path will increase in presence of vacuum. Okay, this much is easy, right. So, now what we were learning here is that because this material that is a source material in this case we have taken aluminum as a material right aluminum. So, this source material when it melts and evaporates it evaporates so rapidly that the layer that forms here right let us say this is a thin layer it forms so fast this layer forms so fast that very little time for rearrangement of the atoms occurs right this deposition occurs so fast that very little time is there for the atoms to rearrange itself okay that's what we were learning you see this one very rapidly so very little rearrangements of atoms occur on the film surface as a result the thickness uniformity shadowing by surface topography and step coverage can be very important issues in PVD. What is step coverage? We will see. Hmm. So, <coughs> now if you see that uh, you have a material, this is your silicon, and then this is silicon dioxide in this pattern. Okay. Now, if you deposit the material, no, the material will get deposited here uniformly, aluminum will get deposited here also uniformly aluminum okay this, this is aluminum this dark one hmm? this is aluminum this is aluminum but in this step this region the deposition not will not be so uniform okay that is called step coverage to cover the step uniformly this area this step will not be covered uniformly right that is what is called the thickness of it is shadowing by surface topography and step coverage right. Step coverage is very important in lot of application and that is why that is a limitation of this particular or the issue with the PVD right. So, in this module let us understand three techniques first one is thermal evaporation, second one is EBM evaporation and third one is sputtering ok. So, now the question here is that if I say that I am going to deposit 1 micron aluminum ok. I am going to deposit 1 micron aluminum. How would I know that it, it has reached 1 micron? That is my first question. Can you can you uh, guess? I will just give you 10 seconds to guess and then we will get back. Think about if I want to deposit 1 micron aluminum, how would you know it is 1 micron? Any idea? Even if you have I cannot hear is not it that is a limitation of online that interactions are less and that is why we have portal right NPDL portal. So, you can ask us questions doubts through the NPDL portal do not ask solution for the assignments not allowed. So, what we will do we will have we will we can use the uh, principle of piezoelectricity, piezoelectric. What is piezoelectric? When there is a pressure there is change in the voltage right. So, you remember what kind of materials are used for piezoelectricity or what are materials that have piezoelectricity right. If you recall there is a material called quads, so quads crystal 
quartz crystal can be used to measure the thickness of this particular material. That means, I can place a quartz in this region is a quartz. So, uh, the material that gets evaporated right on to the wafer which is a substrate will also get evaporated onto a crystal which is quartz and when it gets deposited onto the quartz the there is a change in the voltage. So, we can use a quartz crystal monitor called QCM to monitor the thickness of the material that we are depositing onto the substrate that is the first point that you need to remember right. QCM quartz crystal monitor can be used to monitor the deposited film how much film is deposited rate of deposition. The another question is that when you heat this boat when you heat the boat right the, the material is melted, but it will take some time for the material all the material to get uniformly melted right. So, should we start evaporation as soon as we apply the voltage to the boat or we wait for certain time. Hmm? So, initially you have here a plate, a plate which is which will cover or mask the deposition right and once these things are uniformly melted right this place this plate is opened. So, it goes uh, a, a, in a different uh, direction and then you can deposit your material you understand. So, you wait till the metal gets melted and then you open the the masking plate right. So, that th when you start deposition it will be uniformly deposited and you can always close the deposition not by just dropping the voltage, but by bringing the plate back into this direction. So, if you bring the plate back right this the material that gets deposited will not reach in this region correct. So, that is how the uh, things are done. So, let us see the slide you can tell me what is this this material or uh, this uh, uh, system and this system. Can anybody guess see what are the uh, things in the system see very closely and carefully and then we will continue discussion uh, just uh, giving one second or two three seconds to look into the photographs. Okay. Okay. We are able to see now, let us start with the number 3, this is number 2, this is number 1. Hmm. So, this is thermal evaporation system okay. and this is electron beam evaporation system, this is automated thermal evaporation system. This is manual thermal evaporation system right evaporator thermal evaporator and this one right is a knob to apply the voltage. This is the meter for understanding how much current flows through the 
uh, source holder or a boat. These are the windows to see you can see whether the boat is melted or not or whether sorry the source in the boat is melted or not. If boat gets melted what will happen all the things will fall and that is the reason why uh, you know in mistake also I said that if the boat is melted what will happen. So, when the boat gets melted let us say you have this and you have material here and the and you apply voltage and the current becomes so high that the boat itself starts melting the material of the boat starts melting what will happen this is not a good idea because then you have two different metals right uh, getting deposited onto the substrate forming an alloy right. So, <coughs> always understand that the material that is used for boat the material that is used for boat should have a way higher melting point compared to the material that we use for deposition all right. So, here the material that we use for deposition was aluminum the material that we use for boat should have way higher melting point melting point compared to aluminum right. That is a very important point and for the material which will not which will have the melting point similar to boat material or greater way greater than boat material then thermal evaporation fails ok. We cannot use thermal evaporation where the material that we are depositing its melting point is way higher than the melting point of the boat material ok. <coughs> so, you need to be careful on uh, where to use thermal evaporator when not to use thermal evaporator. Now, what other things you can see ok that is not all about thermal evaporation. The other thing that you see is this one this is a chamber so is this one and so is this one these are all chambers. Now, you say oh you drawn like this but this does not look like this it does not have to does not have to look like this ok. What I am saying is there should be a chamber in which you can create a vacuum right and in this case you have only you have two windows actually you see here closely, but this is very clearly you can vis it is visible one is the window to look at the substrate one is the window to look at the source one is a window for the substrate one is a window for the source ok easy what we have seen there is a and of course, here the whole electronics is there to apply the voltage here it is automated you set the parameter automatically deposition will occur and it will stop. Hmm. Now, the other things other things very important to understand the equipment so that it becomes easier and just we are not just doing this uh, for the for the sake of theory ok. I will be showing you the experimental labs in which we will show how the EBM and thermal evaporation system actually works ok. So, so let us not worry about it uh, too much if you do not get uh, too much clarity from this schematic or from the photographs ok. The next thing that we need to see if you see the, the picture is this particular region in this it is uh, not too visible in here uh, everything is uh, within it or in the back side of it, but but uh, is, this is a good good photo because I want to I want you to look at this particular gauge ok. There are generally two gauges so this is by the way uh, secondary pump secondary pump and then always there is a primary pump primary pump ok. Primary pump and secondary pumps are used to create vacuum ok and um, uh, generally we use turbo molecular pump turbo molecular pumps to create vacuum vacuum can be 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 7 tor right 10 to the power minus 6 to 10 to the power minus 7 tor 
Hmm. This will be a uh, range in which the vacuum is created into the uh, vacuum chamber, right? And because every or physical evaporation uh, method, whether it is thermal evaporation, whether it is e-beam evaporation, or whether it is sputtering, right? All the three different techniques or evaporation techniques are uh, <coughs> or requires right all three reopening technique requires vacuum and that is why these these techniques are also called vacuum deposition techniques. So, if in some books if you see vacuum deposition techniques do not worry about it right physical deposition techniques are also called vacuum deposition techniques ok because the deposition occurs in the presence of vacuum ok. So, now what you have seen primary pump, secondary pump these pumps are used to create vacuum. Now, let us go to the next point uh, it is very complicated than what I am showing it to you ok. Uh, I am just showing the the easy easy <laughs> part of this system right the system is way too complicated, uh, but we do not have to worry because you have to utilize system not make the system. If you are interested in making an entire system with electronics then we can go into that particular direction right now you uh, should be interested in what kind of systems are there and how we can use the system ok. So, now <coughs> there is one more thing here this is called gauge ok. There are two gauges one is called Pirani. and panning Pirani and panning gauges ok. So, the Pirani gauge is used for uh, uh, for measuring low vacuum uh, about 10 to the minus 3 torres and greater than 10 to the power minus 3 all the way to 10 to the power minus 7 or minus 8 torr can be measured with the help of panning gauge right. Pirani is still 10 to the power minus 3, panning is for greater than 10 to the power minus 3 onwards. So, these are some of the uh, some of the things that you need to understand about the evaporation system, right. Now, as I mentioned, um, we can um, uh, divide the physical evaporation into two techniques, one is evaporation one is sputtering, but within evaporation you have thermal and you have E beam ok thermal and E beam. Now, we also discussed we also discussed that there are three deposition techniques and that is why I say three ok, but based on the way based on the way that film is deposited. Uh, thermal and e-beam falls in similar zone while sputtering falls in another zone ok. So, physical methods produce the atoms that deposit on the substrate uh, we can call them as a evaporation or sputtering techniques and sometimes called vacuum deposition right because the process is usually done in a evacuated chamber. Now, generally PVD is used for depositing metals but dielectrics can also be deposited using specialized equipment. Hmm. So, let us go to the next slide. So, in the evaporation techniques of PVD a vacuum chamber is pumped down less than 10 to power minus 5 torr ok that is the first thing we need to understand. Second is that evaporation atoms from the source condense on the surface of the wafer right we have seen that uh, that when you uh, melt the material it will get deposited onto the wafer the rearrangement of atoms will not happen or does not have that much we do not have that much time because it the deposition occurs so rapidly right. So, atoms would not have time to rearrange itself. The heater can be of resistive type generally tungsten filament is used and it is heats up as the current flows through it. Now, this depends on again what kind of material that you use so, whether it is resistive heating or some other types of heating, but more the most popular is an E beam open system in which a high energy electron beam is focused onto source material in the crucible using magnetic fields. So, 
when the e beam comes i will tell you what is advantage of e beam right now just understand that e beam is um, you have a crucible all right and there is a electron beam that is uh, created it comes and it uh, you know scans this particular material and because the heat that is created because of the electron bombardment right onto this material right this material gets melted and gets deposited but the way to travel and to form an angle right all these things are um, uh, not so easy we need to understand how the magnetic fields where the magnets are placed uh, how the accelerator works how the electrons are accelerated further right, how the bending works because of the magnetic field all these things are important you have a spot uh, beam you have a raster mechanism for the beam uh, so there are different way of using electron beam operation system um, why to use e beam is very simple reason that you have substrate source either like this or this right and if the material that we use material that we use on this one right like this material m if the melting point melting melting point of material is way greater than melting point of boat or source holder thermal evaporation fails right because this material will will evaporate faster than the material that we want to deposit hmm. so that is why when this are the cases when such materials we want to deposit we go for the electron beam evaporation ok and that is the reason of e beam evaporation when the material that you want to deposit has a very high melting point then the material that you are using for the boat then we need to uh, go for the e beam operation system and depending on the method of e operation and the hardware e operation technique can be categorized as thermal e operation and e beam e operation now very important thing that comes uh, when we are depositing a film uh, using this uh, e operation technique and that is called mean free path hmm? here mean free path is given by lambda and mean free path lambda is nothing but the average distance a molecule travels before it collides so uh, you have this uh, boat and you have this substrate here uh, how much the material that is here right? how much material can travel before it collides with something and gets distracted right how much it can travel so the higher the mean free path the better the chance of we have deposition uniform deposition right so this with what it will collide it will collide with some particles or residual gas molecules and to remove this residual gas molecules we use we use vacuum right to increase the mean free path the longer the path is the better the deposition correct so the mean free path lambda uh, is average distance of a molecule travels before it collides with the residual gas molecule and uh, it is uh, given by lambda equals to kt uh, by under root of 2 pi td square where t is uh, absolute temperature of the chamber d is gas molecule diameter um, pressure is p k is boltzmann constant and if you want to take an example right to solve it right uh, we will solve a lot of uh, mathematical questions uh, some problems uh, <coughs> uh, in the TA class, but uh, uh, let us take one such example here. Uh, consider a nitrogen gas molecule whose diameter is 3 angstrom and the temperature of the chamber is 300 Kelvin. Calculate the mean free path of the gas. Now, if you have 3 angstrom, which is D, T equals to 300 Kelvin, we know the formula lambda equals to KT by under root of 2 pi uh, PD square and we put the values right then uh, we can say that for 10 raise to power minus 6 lambda would be 78 meters uh, the gas molecule can travel for 78 meters without any collision with other molecule if 
your p equals to 10 power minus 6 and if the gas molecule diameter is of 3 angstrom and if the temperature of the chamber is 300 Kelvin. Right? So, this is way the lambda is calculated like I said higher the mean free path better the chances of uniform deposition. The next question that comes um, into our mind is the what and what are the different kind of evaporation sources right now I have shown it to you uh, in the drawing in the schematic, but these are way more than what I have shown it to you correct. These are all evaporation sources ok, all evaporation sources hmm. and uh, you start with the tungsten wire sources right tungsten wire sources. Um, so, tungsten is used as a crucible material this evaporation uh, evaporant wets tungsten and retained by surface tension. Um, uh, the refractory metal sheet sources are made up of tungsten, tantalum and molybdenum sheet materials uh, and is used for poor wetting evaporation uh, evaporants or powders. Then we have sublimation furnaces in which the evaporation of sulphides, selenides and some oxides as pellets are possible. The evaporation from these sources tend to be constant over extended periods of time. Uh, while there are crucible sources generally cylindrical cups of Al 2 or 3, uh, Bn, graphite and refractory metals uh, uh, that, are, that are used as a crucible sources uh, and normally heated by external tungsten wire and uh, sometimes high frequency induction rather than resistance heating is also used for such sources. So, if you use if you if you see the thermal evaporation then uh, like I have shown it to you earlier there is a vacuum chamber then there is a wafer holder uh, or you can say substrate holder um, and then there are wafers placed here right source material or heater resistance here there is a vacuum system right uh, that will help to uh, keep the vacuum intake and then uh, the, the, the thermal evaporation systems relies on uh, energy supply to the crucible which is crucible is here right or boat to evaporate the atoms. Uh, evaporated atoms travel through the evacuated space between source and the sample. Uh, surface reaction usually occurs very rapidly and there is very little time of rearrangement. You see this is again we came back to the same point that there is very little time of rearrangement of the surface atoms after sticking. Uh, the thickness uniformity and shadowing by surface topography as well as step coverages are the issue. So, in this case if you see these are the substrate uh, these are the source holder, four source holders are there. This is the photo within the thermal evaporation system um, uh, and we can have four different sources at, at a one time only one source can be used, but we can load different material and we can also form different layers of the material or the alloys. Okay. So, we will go to the next slide and next slide is a video. So, I will just play the video, you look into the video and see how the thermal evaporation works. Okay. Then you, the question that comes to our mind is what happens if we want to evaporate an alloy. Mm -hmm. So, in that case uh, the binding energy of metals in alloy is different uh, than the binding energy of atoms in metal that we already know. Right? So, the metal atoms are less tightly bound than atoms in an inorganic compound constituents tend to evaporate independently depending on temperature and enter vapor phase as independent atoms. Thus, let us take an example let us say A and B are two metals and A B is an alloy. Okay. It is a mixture of two metals I, I hope that you know what is alloy. Okay. Um, now, activation energy of A B bond is different than activation energy of A A or B B bonds you agree with that. So, metallic melts can be considered a solution of two materials partial pressure of A in A B at temperature T P A is not equal to partial pressure of pure A at T or P A at 0. Similarly, B for material B the partial pressure of B in A B is different than from pure B right. So, P A can be gamma A x A rho A or P A 0 where uh, the gamma A is the activity coefficient and x a is a mole fraction of a. So, from this what we can understand actually to cut the story short we can find out the flux ratio okay. and from flux ratio we can understand um, how the how the materials that are we, we are using for forming an alloy 
right uh, has to be considered and how the vapor pressure as well as film composition depends on temperature and properties of the materials all right. So, uh, uh, when you want to deposit an alloy you need to understand that what should be the temperature, what should be the property of material, what, we, what should be the vapor pressure. Now, <coughs> what we have discussed earlier is on the thermal evaporation and I told you the limitation of the thermal evaporation system that in thermal evaporation system if the metal uh, or the material that is loaded onto the source is melting point is higher than the source material we cannot use thermal evaporation, but in that case we can use the E beam evaporation and I uh, you can see this particular uh, schematic you have a filament right where there is a generation of the electrons then there are accelerated electrodes to accelerate the electron beam right then there is a electron beam which is forming here there is a deflecting magnet which is which looks like this and then this deflecting magnet will deflect the electron and the electron will be focused or the beam will be focused on the crucible that contains the source that contains the source when electron beam is at the point source or as a raster scanning falls on the source which is loaded into the crucible the material which is the source material will start melting and this melt molten material will start evaporating will start evaporating. Thus, in this case you are not heating you are not heating the crucible correct that means the crucible has to play the material of the crucible has to play no role except that it should withstand high temperature uh, and there is a coolant also on the back side to keep cooling the crucible from the back side all right. Now, if you see the <coughs> second schematic which is here right you can see how you can block the evaporation still you feel that the, the there is a uniformity of the melting uh, material here also you can see the same thing right this is the material here when it starts evaporating you can remove this thing from the uh, from the evaporation site and then you can you can deposit the material ok. So, but this very important plate it's a it's a masking plate that will not allow the material to get deposited because the substrate is somewhere here if I just have a bigger chamber right and here the material gets deposited but it cannot pass through this right. Only when you remove this plate from the path then only the material will start depositing onto the substrate. So, electron beam or E beam operation is a physical operation technique um, that allows the user to evaporate materials that are difficult or sometimes even impossible to process using the uh, resistive thermal evaporation. Some of these materials would have extremely high temperature. Now, for generating the electron beam an electrical current is applied to a filament which is subject to high electric field it is here. This will cause the electrons in the filament to escape and accelerate with the help of accelerating electrodes. The electrons are focused by magnets to form a beam directed towards the crucible that contains the material here. The energy of the E beam is transferred to the material to start evaporation and many materials with either melt or sublimate directly sublimate. So, this is a uh, region where you can have your crucible uh, the electrical supply electron filament gun wafer cooling and deposition monitor right. You can see quartz crystal monitor deposition monitor. Hmm. So, generally the uh, QCMs are present within the chamber so as to measure the deposition rate. So, as we have discussed earlier the E beam operation is a is a rescue for the users who would like to use materials which have extremely high melting point. The water cooled crucibles or in the depression of water cooled copper hearth the source holder is placed which is crucible is placed and the crucible there is a source the electrons are thermo 
ionically emitted from the heated filaments, but are shielded from direct line of sight of the evaporant charge and the substrate. The filament cathode assembly potential is biased negatively of course, with respect to the nearby grounded anode and this will accelerate the electrons. A transverse magnetic field is applied which serves to deflect the electron beam in a 270 degree circular arc and it, it then the focus it on the earth and evaporation charge at the ground potential right. So, let us see the video for the same uh, and we will continue from there. So, what is what are the power densities right power the electric practically the power densities are approximately of 10 kilowatt per centimeter square and are used utilized in melting metals, but dielectric require only 1 to 2 kilowatt per centimeter square. The contamination level of the repository film using E beam evaporation is less compared to other EPVD methods. The E beam current density J leaving the hot filament is due to the thermoionic emission that we know and is, expect, is uh, expressed by Richardson's equation which is given here and uh, near to the evaporation surface evaporation flux evaporant flux shows a laminar flow while the uniformity of the thickness can be described by the cosine law right. Uh, now, you please read why we are placing the uh, substrate at almost 90 degree with respect to the source material it was a reason right just look into that and then you understand what is cosine law and you will have your answer. So, <coughs> when you talk about E beam evaporation then there are E beam evaporation sources as well. So, there is a single source uh, where you can only hold one material uh, then there are rotary pockets that means, you can have four different uh, rotary pockets if the first is exposed then you can rotate it then the second will expose then you can rotate it third will get and fourth will get like the, this is the rotary mechanism. You can also have linear pockets where you have multiple uh, sources, but linearly it comes in the uh, in the path of the electron beam. So, let us read the first one which is the single pocket a water cooled copper block is bored out of out to us have a pocket in the shape of inverted truncated cone source material is placed here. So, it is placed inside ok uh, and within a crucible or whose exterior fits squarely within the pocket. So, when you have this when I am drawing this it is not exact, but the point is it will just fit very well in this region ok. Uh, it will not come out it will not go too deep exactly it fits well here. Hmm. So, that is a source holder that fits well or crucible. A magnetic structure consists of a permanent magnet and two pole extensions are located around the block such that field lines run parallel to side of the block. On the same side of the block uh, is a filament right we, this is same thing uh, that we they are saying, but the point is it, it comes from here and the beam is uh, focused here. So, electron beam energy is controlled such that the magnetic field will bend it precisely into the center of the pocket uh, as I have drawn in the figure right an additional electromagnetic coil called a sweep coil is employed to effectively raster the beam. So, one is that continuously the beam falls on this source and then this is a point. So, the deposition is faster second one is it will st it will it will go like this then from here then here then here then here again like this ok. Uh, and is this way. So, triangular formation raster formation um, all things are possible because of the electromagnetic coil uh, which is additional called as a sweep coil is placed in the mechanism. A variety of patterns are used in control program for electromagnetic coil materials with lower melting points melt readily and build a crucible they do not require x y sweep, but the materials with high melting point you see this is a very important point requires the x y sweep to prevent the electron beam from boring a hole. Because if you just keep on uh, uh, using this electron beam at one particular source right let us say this is the material right it will start only taking out the material in this fashion right for the material that are of high melting point. This is a material and if you electron beam is only focused on one point it will form a hole ok form a hole and that is what we do not want. So, in that case you use the x y sweep. 
as I mentioned a rotary pocket electron beam source has all same pass a single point unit. However, uh, the with the design a number of different materials can be operated sequentially because like I said this is uh, if, if you say this one is the first pocket right and you have four pockets then you can have different sources that you can evaporate. Uh, this design includes additional shielding to prevent cross contamination this is this shielding this one okay this is a shielding um, and the pocket in position is chosen via motorized or rotary uh, indexer. The final one which is a linear pocket linear pocket electron beam source is similar to rotary pocket source except that its pocket are arranged in a line and are indexed in a position in a linear fashion the common magnet emitter sweep coil structure all right. So, this is these are four diff or three different type of electron beam evaporation sources uh, that we need to kind of just uh, understand right? that there are three different uh, uh, evaporation sources what for electron beam evaporation. So, <coughs> here we will stop and the next uh, uh, in a class we will continue what is glow discharge and plasma and followed by uh, PVD sputtering techniques. Uh, so, uh, in fact, let us let us do this thing. Let us uh, finish the glow discharge and plasma, and we continue DC sputtering in uh, or sputtering uh, in the in the next class. Okay. So, let us let me continue. So, the glow discharge and plasma. What exactly this means? Okay. So, now you have, uh, but actually, this glow discharge and plasma comes into uh, play when we go for this sputtering. Uh, so, let us understand first glow discharge and plasma, and then we go further uh, into the mechanism. Okay. So, here you have uh, again a chamber, you have a chamber, you have a matching network. So, we have moved from the E beam and thermal evaporation to a technique called sputtering, where it is a mechanical way of dislodging the atoms from the source and depositing onto a substrate. Okay. First, let us understand what exactly glow discharge and plasma is, and we'll, then we will see how, how the sputtering works. So, in this case, again we require vacuum because sputtering is also a vacuum deposition technique okay it requires vacuum then we have either dc sputtering dc sputtering or we have rf sputtering radio frequency sputtering so uh, uh, this two images that you see right are of both dc and rf sputtering and in rf sputtering you require a matching network as well uh, uh, the 13.56 megahertz is the rf frequency uh, then you have a target, you have a substrate. So, you see here the substrate are placed and are in this fashion right. Until now what we are doing the substrate source was at the bottom and the substrate were at the top. In this case this substrate is at the bottom and the source is at the top right, source is at the top. So, this is the source. So, these are the plates ok, these are the plates and uh, the substrate are anode the source is cathode uh, we can apply we, the sputtering gas we can flow through here generally argon is used as a sputtering gas and from the cathode to anode there is a cathode sheet there is an anode sheet right and when you apply a potential this is how the, uh, the the difference between anode and cathode can be seen and also very important point is that the positive ions in the discharge glow strike the target and eject neutral atoms by momentum transfer and the electrical neutral plasma contains partially ionized gas composed of ions, electrons and neutral spaces. The secondary electrons uh, dissolved gases, x-rays and photons can be emitted from the target. Now, what exactly the all these things that I have read means ok. So, first thing to understand is that the between the cathode and anode between the cathode and anode. So, between this one and this one or this one and this one right. Uh, we apply uh, some kilo volts of kilo volts of power densities ok. So, kilo volts of power. The substrate may be grounded electrically floating or heated or cooled. After evacuation of the chamber a gas typically argon as I told argon is used as a sputtering gas right uh, uh, for this sputter is introduced to serve as discharge medium and a sustained visible discharge called avalanche breakdown of the medium is maintained between electrodes and a film condenses on the substrate which is anode. Now, what will happen is because of this uh, voltage that we apply between cathode and anode the positive ions in the discharge glow strike the target. So, the, the, the in the glow discharge this will 
strike the target let me just when you introduce the sputtering gas right this will the positive ions will start striking the target hmm, from the glow discharge striking the target. So, when it happens what will occur the uh, neutral target atoms will start dislodging start dislodging and we start dislodging what will happen it will form the layers on the substrate right that is what it means hmm. discharge glow strike the target eject neutral target by momentum transfer and this pass through the discharge region to deposit the film on the substrate. Again when you have vacuum and you and we allow the argon to flow and you apply a very high voltage there is a glow discharge the argon ions will bombard the target and the atoms from the target the neutral atoms from the target they are dislodged and they form a thin film on the substrate right and substrate are silicon wafer. The next thing is the electrically neutral plasma contains partially ionized gas composed of ions electrons and neutral species within and also very important is when there is a, this striking of this uh, ions onto the uh, onto the target material right the second electrons that are dissolved gases and x-rays and photons can be emitted from the target. So, this is something it is very important and that is why sometimes the uh, sputtering is not used uh, for uh, fabrication of some of the uh, electronic materials uh, electronic uh, devices like transistors because the secondary electrons in the x-ray would cause the damage uh, uh, while fabrication. But, but for us to just understand the focus on that, that when you when the ions are bombarding on the target there is a for, there is a secondary electrons then uh, there are x-rays and photons that can be emitted from the target. So, if you want to understand further that how the glow discharge and plasma uh, 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 between the cathode and anode uh, occurs then you need to understand that uh, when you apply a voltage between cathode and anode the next to cathode is always a cathode glow and next to anode is anode glow. So, first is there is a cathode glow one is the anode glow ok. Then uh, the substrate are placed here and you have a negative glow and then there is something called cathode crooks or dark space ok the crooks dark space and or cathode dark space and then be, be between the positive column and the anode here there is something called Faraday's dark space ok and uh, in between anode glow and positive column there is a anode dark space this much you understand. Now, the DC glow discharge consists of few luminous regions and adjacent to the cathode there is a highly luminous layer known as cathode glow where neutralization of the incoming discharge is ions and positive cathode ions occurs. Second electrons start to accelerate away from the cathode in this area in between the crooks dark space a region where nearly all the applied voltage is dropped within the dark space the positive gas ions are accelerated towards the cathode right. So, uh, the positive ions are accelerated towards the cathode and what happens is that the next distinct region is negative glow right where the excited electrons acquire enough energy to impact ionize the neutral gas molecules. Now, beyond the Faraday dark space which is this one right um, and finally, the positive column um, the substrate anode is placed inside the negative glow um, during the discharge or during the sputtering and the breakdown voltage that is required for creating the plasma is given by the Pascal's law. Uh, which is right over here where a p is a chamber pre chamber pressure and l is the electrode spacing and b is constant. So, it is very important to again understand that what should be the distance between the electrodes uh, that is between the anode and cathode if the distance is more than uh, the deposition will be slower if the distance is too close the heating of the substrate will occur. Uh, so, that is why sometimes you need to cool down the substrate uh, uh, and also the uh, the pressure is very important in case of the uh, sputtering. Uh, so, this is, this is some of the things that we need to remember when it comes to glow discharge and plasma. Uh, in the next uh, lecture right we will continue with sputtering uh, and the types of sputtering just you need to understand glow and plasma discharge again uh, I will not be asking you questions from that because it is just understanding about how when you use sputtering what is within the chamber ok. So, let us not go into thin film physics, uh, but let us understand that there is a glow 
there is a plasma discharge and then there is a, a voltage between anode and cathode right with a, what are the, uh, uh, the, the mechanism uh, when you apply uh, argon or when you insert the argon gas how the ions bombard the target or dislodging the atoms. So, dislodging the atoms that means now you are not evaporating you are not melting it right you are dislodging it that means this is a mechanical way of depositing the film onto a substrate rather than melting the uh, material and then evaporating. Okay. So, this is something that we need to understand in the next uh, uh, lecture we will be talking quickly on uh, DC sputtering, RF sputtering, magnetron sputtering and reactive sputtering. Uh, till then uh, uh, you just go through this class once again right do not get overwhelmed with uh, some of the terms, uh, but just do understand that when we go for uh, physical vapor deposition techniques there are three. Uh, one is evaporation, one is sputtering within evaporation, there is thermal evaporation and EBM evaporation and sputtering. There are different kind of sputtering where you apply DC, then DC sputtering, RF, then RN sputtering, magnetron sputtering and so on and so forth. Um, and this all things falls under physical vapor deposition to deposit a different materials. This is advantage and limitations of each of these techniques. So, we should be careful when you want to make a device, when you make a transistor, when you make a chip right which particular technique we need to use right and what are the advantages over the other techniques. So, till then you take care uh, I will see you in the next class cheers.